Hello everyone and welcome back to Supply Chain Management. In this module, and this is the first lecture of this module, we will start with demand forecasting. And we will talk a little bit about demand forecasting. We'll talk about how we measure the errors. We'll talk a little bit about the techniques we're going to use but we are really not going to go into how to do a forecast. That'll be in the next couple of videos. But right now, it is about talking about demand forecasting. So let's look at the role of demand forecasting in a supply chain. All planning decisions in a supply chain depend upon forecasting. Now, remember, we talked about the, the three different levels of supply chain. We talked about uh, supply chain strategy and design. Then we talked about the tactical aspect, which is planning, which is over a year or maybe six months. And then we talked about the operational part, which is more day-to-day -day operations. Now, the middle part, the planning decisions, all start with forecasting. And this is the first thing you're going to do. It is used for both push and pull processes. And we use forecasting for production scheduling, inventory management, aggregate planning, Salesforce allocation, promotions, new product in introduction, plant and equipment in investment, budgetary planning, workforce planning, and layoff. So you can see that all these decisions are linked with each other you know if you're going to increase your production you're going to affect your workforce planning right and similarly you want to reduce your production uh your inventory might come into play i mean so all these are linked together and we'll see in this class how these are all kind of linked together the characteristics of demand forecasting and let's let's start with the first thing about forecasting is you are always going to be wrong it's always going to be inaccurate there's always an error should always include the expected value of the forecast and the measure of forecast error so you really have to look at on average what your forecast is going to be and what your error is going to be and it's probably a good idea to build in confidence intervals into your forecast. Long-term forecasts are less accurate than short-term. So if you, the further behind your data is, the less accurate your forecast is going to be. And then aggregate forecast is more accurate than disaggregate forecast. And when I talk about aggregation, it could be aggregation in terms of uh, time. It could be temporal. So a, a forecast for the entire year will be more accurate than forecast for a month, which will be more accurate than forecast for a week, right? The smaller you're slicing things down, the less accurate it's going to be. And it could also be, uh, you know, uh, so for example, for the entire company is aggregated. And then when you want to break it down to a region, to store, it gets smaller and smaller, the pieces, and it gets less and less accurate. And then further up the supply chain, the greater the distortion of information re received. So the further you away you are from the actual customer, right? So if you look at the example where you have a customer coming and buying something at Walmart, and if you're right at the start of the supply chain, you have a greater chance of distortion of information there. So the competence of, of forecast is um, you want to identify the factors that influence future demand. Uh, you are looking at the relationship between these factors and the future demand. And the factors that influence future demand are past demand. And we're going to use this uh, predominantly in this class about how to use past demand to, to kind of predict your future demand. Lead time of product replenishment, planned advertising or marketing efforts, planned price discounts, state of the economy, and actions competitors have taken so if you're in 2020 and you had COVID-19 and the economy has tanked that's going to affect your demand completely irrespective of past demand or you're in 2008 with the recession again you're going to have a problem there so the different methods of forecasting and the first one is qualitative which is primarily subjective and relies on judgment of experts 
Uh, this is not a very scientific method, but it's more, more an opinion, but an opinion of people who have been in the field, in the industry for a long period of time, and therefore might actually, they might actually know something than someone who's just Googled the information. Time series method, which is what we are going to use. We are going to use historical demand only, and then predict our future demand. This is useful for figuring out what patterns have happened in the past. And it's best when demand repeats itself. That is, the past repeats it itself. And then finally, causal, where there's a relationship between demand and some other factor. We can also use simulation, which imitates customer choices that give rise to demand. But we are not going to get into that in this class. So the approach to demand forecasting is first we got to understand the objective of forecasting uh, we have to integrate that with demand planning and forecasting throughout the supply chain we have to identify the major factors that influence demand forecast we end up doing the forecast at the appropriate level of aggregation and finally establish performance and error measures for the forecast now any observation can be broken up into two components, the systematic component and the random component. The systematic component is what you're expecting the value of demand to be, it's something you can predict. And that can be broken up into three parts, level, trend, and seasonality. Level is the current deseasonalized demand, which is essentially small fluctuations which happen randomly. Trend is the growth or de decline of demand over a long period of time. And seasonality is predictable seasonal fluctuations. That is up and down uh, because of specific seasonality. That is, in the summer, you're going to have an increase in uh, the sales of uh, swimsuits because you can predict that, right? The random component is the part of the forecast that deviates from the systematic component. So you can calculate this systematic component, but you can't calculate the random component. And that gives us the forecasting error, the difference between the forecast and actual demand. So the systematic component can be multiplicative, where we multiply level, trend, and seasonal factor. It can be additive, where we add level, trend, and seasonal factor or you can have a mixed model where you add level and trend and multiply time seasonal factor. The error term, the error in the forecast, is basically your forecast minus your demand. And so here we have the math formula E regarding error, T is time period T, F is forecast, and D is demand. The bias for n readings is the sum of n errors. So as you add the errors, some of them will be positive when forecast is higher than demand. Some of them will be negative when forecast is less than demand. And the bias kind of shows um, if the bias is positive, then over a period of time, you have forecast more, you're forecasting more than your demand. If bias is negative, then you're forecasting less than demand overall. The absolute error is the absolute value of this ET. And then you have what we call as the tracking signal. The tracking signal monitors any forecast that may have be made in comparison with the actual and warns when there are unexpected departures from the outcomes from the forecast. So the tracking signal of plus minus six uh, anything outside that, that means the forecast is biased. If it's less than plus minus six, then we, we don't look at it as, as biased. So tracking signal here is your bias, which you're calculated here, divided by the mean absolute deviation or MAD. And I'll talk about what this MAD is very soon on the next slide. So your error terms, you can have mean squared error, which is your average squared error. That is, you take your error term, you square it, you sum up all the squared errors, and then you find the average. You divide it by the number of values. 
your root mean squared error is your average error or the square root of mean squared error. Your mean absolute deviation, which I talked about in the previous slide, is your average absolute error. So you take your absolute error, you sum it all up, and then you take the average of that. And the mean absolute percentage error is the average percent error. And here we take each error term and divide it by your actual demand. You take the absolute value of that, sum of, sum of all of it, and then take, divide it by the number of values, which will give you this average percent error. Now, we have so many different error terms. Uh, root mean squared error, mean absolute deviation error, both give you the average error. They both mean the same thing and yet they give you different values and we'll talk about that absolute percentage error gives you the percentage change and we'll talk about that too so mad is a better measure than root mean squared error or mean squared error if your forecasting error does not have a symmetric distribution that is if the forecasting error the error terms are not kind of equally plus minus that is if you have a bias right if your tracking signal is over plus minus six then mad is a better measure than msc right but if it's symmetric that is less than there's no bias it's your bias is basically zero then msc might actually work okay now even if forecasting error is symmetric mad is better if the cost of the forecasting error is proportional to the size of the error. And the reason is because when you're taking the squared of everything, it basically magnifies the error, even though you're taking the square root later. And so your mean absolute deviation is more proportional to the size of the error. MAPE is a good measure when the underlying forecast has significant seasonality and demand varies considerably from one season to another. Normally, I would like to sh always give one absolute value like MAD or root mean squared error, and then a percentage value, which gives us a very good idea about the scale, right? So let me give you an example of how percentage error could be misleading. If you had, uh, let's say, an increase from five, um, let me get a pen out. Here we go. Five and it increases to 10. That's a hundred percent increase. And yet when it increases from hundred to 110, that is a 10% increase. So here we have hundred percent increase and here we have 10% increase. Yet in absolute terms, this is actually greater increase than this so you can see how percentage error could be misleading similarly your absolute error also can be misleading and so it is better than to do both so errors in the forecast are assumed to be normally distributed and therefore the MAD for normal distribution is given by this value and therefore your standard deviation comes to about 1.25 times your MAD. And if you're going to use this, you can then use this to build confidence intervals and I'll talk about this uh, in, in the next video. The mean of the random component is estimated to be zero. So We've talked about error terms. It's important for you to know all the error terms. And now we're going to talk about static versus adaptive forecasting. We're going to have two more lectures, one lecture on static forecasting and another lecture on adaptive forecasting. So static forecasting assumes that level trend and seasonality does not change when new data comes in. So what we do is we calculate this right at the beginning and then we keep it constant, right? Whereas adaptive forecasting assumes that level trend and seasonality varies with new data. So we constantly are taking new data 
to update these values, and therefore we constantly update them with every new demand data. So that's why this is static, and that is adaptive. We will go into how to use these different forecasting methods in the next lectures. But before we conclude, let's talk a little bit about the importance of information technology in forecasting. Forecasting module in any software is the core supply chain software. And you want to determine what's the best forecasting method for the firm by product categories and market. And real-time updates are needed to keep the firms uh, responsive, quickly responsive to the marketplace. And forecasting then feeds into demand planning. Without forecasting, you cannot do any demand planning. So in practice, you have to collaborate to build forecasts, not only within departments, but across the supply chain. You've got to share the data that truly provides value and you have to make sure the difference between demand and sales. Now remember, demand need not kind of end up becoming sales, okay? So the next video is we're gonna start talking about is static forecasting. And with this, we'll stop this video.